Can you all hear me? Thumbs up? Great. Okay, I will do a short um, introduction. Um, I'm going to share my screen of what we're going to do today. And this is also our first time. Um, so hopefully everything runs smoothly. Um, so. Uh, everyone can see my screen? Great, amazing. Um, so my name is Babette and I'm uh, the track lead for track C together with Nancy, who's also here uh, in the call. And um, so, well, you've all been working really hard since Friday night and we've seen the pitches progress from Friday night till Saturday, uh, till today. And I think everyone has made great progress and um, so many great ideas and it's, it's amazing to see how themes from all over the world some people I think met in, in the middle of the midst of their nights or their earliest of their morning uh, to get together and work on their uh, work on their uh, ID and their pitch it's truly really amazing uh, what you've come up with and um, we're super excited to have um, our final presentations today um, so I'm gonna briefly walk you one more time through the judging criteria um, I mean, I know you have your presentations ready, so I hope you knew this um, before. Um, <clears throat> so uh, they will look at the impact. So uh, what kind of, of uh, real problem is it solving? Um, is it sort of addressing the important challenges identified in the prompt? Um, how innovative is your, uh, is your solution? Um, have you thought about implementation? How are you gonna implement it? Who are gonna be uh, the different partners in the different stages? Um, how are you going to roll it out? And uh, finally, also important, the presentation. So um, were you able to actually convey your message, convey your solutions, and are the judges um, convinced by uh, your solutions? So then, then our judges for today. Uh, maybe one by one, you could briefly uh, unmute yourself and introduce yourself. Maybe start by Ryan. Hi guys, can you hear me okay? Yes, great. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Ryan Crone. I'm the Director of Innovation for Early Cancer Detection up here in Oregon, Portland, Oregon, at the uh, Oregon Health and Science University. So I'm excited to be here. Great to have you. Casper Jewell? Yes, I'm Casper Jewell. I am the Director of External Innovation at the Leo Science and Tech Hub in Cambridge. Um, I have a business background and innovation, uh, primarily worked in commercial roles in tech companies and, and larger corporates. Um, and before my current role, I used to manage all our uh, telemedicine activities um, that we have in, in Leo Pharma. Great, thank you. Michael? Hi, this is Michael Palantoni. I lead a group at Athena Health called Platform Services, which is inclusive of our API, our marketplace, our app ecosystem, working with startups all the way through Fortune 50 companies. Great, thanks. And finally, Kriti? Hi, I'm Kriti Subramaniam. I have been one of the MIT Hacking Medicine co-directors for the last two years, and I'm also a PhD candidate at MIT and Harvard Med School. Awesome. Great. So a lot of experience and especially relevant um, for our track. Um, so uh, we have a lot of partners um, that we're working together with. We're super excited. And um, so one of our main goals as well is to really make sure that after our hackathon, as many of the ideas can get implemented. Uh, and therefore, we're going to try and work together with our partners as, as good as possible um, and to see uh, how we can get all of your ideas out in the world. Um, so before starting, um, maybe quickly, um, this is the order of um, the presentations today. Um, I've been messaging some of you that for some of you, we have not received your, uh, your slides. So, um, we're going to see if you don't have your slides, we're going to maybe go on to the next one and see what we can do in the end. Um, every team will have three minutes to present. I'm going to be very strict today because we have, a, like, as you can see, 22 teams back to back. 
Um, then we have two minutes for um, Q&A from our judges. So uh, judges, I would like to ask you to, we're gonna see how it works. Just try to uh, pitch in, uh, ask a question, give some feedback. Um, and if it doesn't work at the same time, we'll do it with, with our hand raised, but let's first try it like that. And I will uh, then once the time is up, introduce uh, the new team. Okay, our first team is MIT Magic. Are you ready? I'm gonna, some of you ask for remote control. Um, if you can let me know who I should give remote control, I can, I can give that. Adele, I think it's you for the first one, right? Please unmute yourself and uh, when you, your presentation is up. Yeah, can I, uh, have you given me control to switch the slides? Yeah, I um, I think I did. did how do you have it? Uh, let's see. Uh, I don't seem to be, I can, it says I can't control, but I'm not able to switch the slides, it seems. Oh, because I gave you now, I, according to my thing, I gave you control. That's okay. If um, Babette, I can just ask you to change the slides if yeah. you're amenable to that. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Great. Okay. All right. Thanks so much, y'all. Yes. The COVID-19 Assisted P Patient Triage, or CAPTAIN for short, is an AI-enabled assistant made to meet the at-home triage needs of patients and providers. We designed the CAPTAIN to reach the elderly. Not only do 138 million seniors experience a condition with symptoms similar to COVID-19 every year, they are also vulnerable to this virus and often experience information gaps. Our solution is rapidly scalable to both seniors and the general population. It is in essence, a low tech solution with a high tech back end. We all know a senior who has trouble with tech. Grandma Ethel is one of those folks, but needs to communicate with a trusted resource if she starts presenting with COVID like symptoms. Next slide, Babette. We have to meet Ethel where she is. The captain is a rapidly scalable voice-driven phone and text-based assistant that uses natural language processing to appraise patients' answers for at-home triage. Next slide. Ethel's provider can reach out to her with an automated call from the captain, or Ethel might find out about the hotline from her community. She calls in and is prompted to describe her symptoms. Before she hangs up, she's told her answers have been recorded and she can expect a call back. Next slide. Ethel's answers are surfaced via the dashboard to the triage provider, who benefits from a simple interface with actionable insights. Her case is prioritized amongst the others by severity using our acuity triage mechanism. The dashboard simplifies her current condition description with quick need-to-know bullets. And the health system's COVID test availability and emergency department statuses are surfaced in real time for quick reference. With this information, the provider can best utilize capacity. Next slide. The captain helps meet all the stakeholders' needs. Patients get a secure and familiar way to receive direction and reduce their risk of exposure. Providers are able to maximize their efficiency through real-time actionable insights. And health systems reduce the cost of manning triage call lines while keeping necessary resources available. Next slide. There are competitors, but we uniquely offer a tool that meets the elderly and tech challenged population where they are without sacrificing benefits to providers. We know there will be regulatory and compliance challenges to navigate. Next slide. So in light of that, we are proud to be working with experienced advisors like AWS and Dr. Ferdinand Huey and Dr. Kieran Marr at Johns Hopkins Medicine. They share with us an understanding of the need for moving quickly with robust capabilities. So we will be using off-the-shelf AWS components for rapid deployment and scale with evidence-based clinical decision trees supplied by Hopkins. Our diverse team is committed to serving the needs of our communities with the most accessible, powerful tool possible. We hope that after two to three weeks of development, we can kick off a, kick off a pilot and scale to a controlled national launch by early summer. Thank you. Great, thank you. Anything from the judges? Uh, maybe I can lead it off. Um, that was fantastic. Thank you for presenting that. Um, you know, my question has to do with the sort of demographic you're addressing, being older and the user interface is usually a challenge. So is your dashboard, uh, is that a, a 
physical person that calls them back and walks them through their options or are they pushed information that they have to sort of interact with? Um, I, I'm happy to answer your question, but I'd love, can we leverage our team members to answer those questions, Babette? Can they unmute themselves? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know if uh, George or Brian wants to handle that for us. Uh, sure, I can do this as George um, <clears throat> on the team. So this was the, the dashboard, um, there's a person on, on the dashboard. So if somebody, uh, one of our elder patients calls in, uh, they would receive, um, uh, they would re, you know, say their symptoms and, and describe their story, uh, which is recorded, uh, parsed through with our, our back end, um, and then automatically triaged. Uh, the person who's looking at the dashboard is someone involved in the clinic or in the clinical care and would call them back, or they could, um, if it's a very low risk, uh, low risk um, scenario, they could also um, output in an automated uh, voice recording, say from recorded by their doctor, for example. So it's, it's someone that the patient will recognize. So it's not just a robo call saying, you know, stay at home, but more like, you know, someone uh, familiar to their, to their ears. Thank you. Thanks, just a quick, quick question from my side. So it's to decrease the serious cases, I'm guessing. Um, and and what? So let's say that the uh, the elderly person calls in. What if you don't get the information needed? Then you would need to call them back. So you need to have somebody on staff that are doing these calls. So you're limiting the calls. That's the idea. Um, because how much? How do you know what information you need, and you get the right information information up front? Is there any guidance to the elderly on on how to do this call? Yeah. We're at five minutes, so make it quick. Um, absolutely. The, the questionnaire or the, excuse me, the assessment is going to be developed by the Hopkins folks that we're working with. And then we will use the AWS solutions to prompt the patient for their responses through uh, and use like voice driven, uh, this voice driven assistant to gather the information and then surface it in a quick, easy to read dashboard for the provider. Thank you for your question. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Are we done? Yeah, sorry, it's really short. <laughs> sorry. Thank you, guys. Nice stuff. Thank you very much. Um, our next team is, let's see, try at home. Are you ready? Uh, yes. <clears throat> I can try to give you remote control. Who's pitching? Um, well, we were going to pitch as a group, but it's OK. I can just tell you when to change this. Like OK, great. Thank you. All right, go ahead. We are Try at Home here to offer an at-home triage solution for COVID-19 change. Normally, about a third of patients in the ER don't need hospitalization and cause overcrowding. Now, with COVID, hospitals are even more overwhelmed because people who experience mild symptoms are unnecessarily coming to the emergency room. This creates two problems, one being a shortage in important medical resources and another being increased risk of spreading the virus change. Let's take a look at Bill a 50-year-old that has a fever and is afraid it's due to COVID-19. He visits the ER, experiences a long wait, and potentially exposes himself to the virus, only to have his temperature and oxygen saturation checked by a nurse, who ultimately decides he doesn't need respiratory support. He gets sent home and his frustration grows. So, how can we avoid this? Next slide. Try at Home is a test kit comprising of a low-cost personal pulse oximeter that is our attempt at flattening the curve so that patients who cannot be helped by emergency care do not flood the system. Next slide, please. After consulting doctors, we determined that the primary reason for COVID hospitalization is to receive oxygen support, a need evaluated by measuring oxygen saturation. And so by placing the power of monitoring this metric in the patient's hands, we prevent a bottleneck effect at hospitals. Change slide, please. Our solution, Try at Home, is a kit containing a pulse oximeter and health information for COVID-19. It will contain infographics on COVID-19 symptoms and how to use a pulse oximeter. These infographics are compatible with social media so they can reach people before they visit the hospital. Next slide. The greatest impact of Try at Home is providing health literacy. Clear information is better than uh, blanket statements like, don't go to the ER. Increasing health literacy will help, one, people know how to protect themselves and their loved ones. Two, people will identify the symptoms that indicate that they should stay home or seek medical attention. And three, the oximeter will teach people uh, what their symptoms imply as seen on the slide. 
people will either avoid the ER or not return. Therefore, try at home will decongest the healthcare system and minimize the spread. Next. We aim to give the kits out to people that have certain key point concerns, such as a fever, but aren't at severe enough risk for needing hospital care. Through our self-monitoring kit, we aim to provide confidence for patients to stay at home. We don't necessarily want to give everyone a kit to prevent panic buying and supply depletion of necessary equipment. And we hope to control the flow of distribution to those who need it. For example, if you're 30 and healthy, you don't need to be frequently checking your O2. However, if you have a cough and a fever, you could pick up a kit and check. We hope to um, start our infographic distribution immediately to help educate people. And then we hope to start distributing kits at hospitals, ERs, triage centers, so patients can pick it up and track their symptoms. Eventually, we do hope to like, start pick up centers at local schools or uh, other local buildings that people can pick up kits to avoid exposure. Um, these are the team members that we worked with. Thank you. So maybe I can lead off again. Uh, thank you guys, that was awesome. Um, my question is, you know, there's a lot of wearables and take home technologies that they can't really diagnose anything, but they can help guide clinical care. That seems to be the value proposition of, of your pull socks because there's a lot of pull socks out there. So my question is, um, what, it, what's the physician's part of all this? How do they interface with, with this? Um, so I think that the main thing that we're trying to do is to, like, the, I guess the physician's role would be to interpret that the information that the pull socks um, provides to the user. So if a person measures their oxygen saturation, um, they will like our information would tell them like, okay, you're at a normal range, you're not. And so when they fall like within the normal range, they can take that information to a doctor and then a doctor based on their physical symptoms and other things that the patient tells them, then they can assess the patient. And so we would be helping like lessening people who don't really need to go to the doctor from going there. Um, I'd also like to add on Oh, sorry. I'd also like to add on that. Um, the point of this is that we, we don't want to drain um, resources and, and especially time. Time is really valuable. Our physicians, especially in the hospital, um, they're not able to provide, they're only providing subpar care right now because they're spread so thin. So if we can actually cut down the time they're having to spend one-on-one -on -one with patients um, with this self-monitoring, um, we've picked a threshold that is very convenient because um, it's a logistic curve. So at 88%, um, a person's oxygen levels drastically start dropping. So it's, it's a perfect threshold for them to go to the hospital. Um, at the, at um, that point. For but the you, record, uh, Magna, real quick, for the record, I just want to say that this would not replace the physician whatsoever. They can call their doctor or they can just go to the ER if they see that there's based on the education provided in the infographs. Thank you for the question. Could you talk a little bit um, about your distribution um, idea? Because some of this seems dependent on sort of knowledge that this product exists and then also the reliance on people to then go out of their homes to pick up a kit seems to be in some places, especially against the advice of people actually leaving their homes or their, wherever they're quarantining. Absolutely. Um, first off, uh, we would like to, the low hanging fruit is- the Sorry, we're over, over five minutes. So we have super short answer. Okay. Low hanging fruit are the people already in the ED. So we would want to supply um, the infographs to the people that are in already going and returning. Secondly, um, to prevent people from going to the ED period, because that's our goal is spreading this, uh, the infographs, spreading the information oh, via Facebook, Instagram. Um, the infographs is knowledge that would be vetted by clinicians. So some sort of petition where clinicians have the ability to review it, to say, absolutely, we agree with this, send it out, and then we could share it. Um, um, for the school, for the uh, real sorry, for the school, no, we have sorry. I'm very sorry. We're out of time. With otherwise, we won't manage it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next team up, Hippobot. All right. Great. Okay. Uh, next. We're Team HIPAA. The problem we're solving is that U.S. clinics are struggling financially because reimbursable patient visits have dropped significantly due to COVID. Rather than scheduling usual appointments with their clinicians, patients who need care are either going directly to the hospital and contributing to overcrowding or delaying the care they need, increasing the risk of complications. This leaves clinicians who have capacity with no way to help patients. Next. 
Our team member, Dr. McBride, is a pediatrician and she's supported by our well-rounded team. Her patients canceled many appointments in favor of social distancing and patients are not scheduling new appointments despite their need. She needs a way to guide patients to reconnect with her via telehealth. Because Dr. McBride's patient visits have been cut in half, she personally needs to furlough three of her nurse practitioners tomorrow and it's happening throughout the US. Pediatric neurologist Dr. Keene is having the same problem, and a total of 43,000 US healthcare workers were laid off in March. Next. To help practices like these, we've developed HippoBot, which sends texts in a conversational tone and drives patients to schedule visits as needed. In our market research survey, 80% of people were interested in their doctor checking in on them via text message. Next. HippoBot can also provide COVID information, resources for med mental health, social determinants of care, and more. Here's a demo of our prototype, which already has the ability to text patients and guide them through a conversational flow based on their needs. Using SMS means our solution can be brought to market quickly and it's already accessible and familiar to patients as well as clinicians. Clinicians can continue to use their existing tools for scheduling, telehealth, medical records, and billing. So to give a quick recap of the conversation that just happened in that video, um, it started by asking whether the patient was willing to participate in this service um, and then it asked whether the patient was feeling sick or well. It asked about their symptoms to help determine whether they needed to have a telehealth visit. And then it let them know that telehealth visits were available and told them what scheduling was available so they could confirm the appointment and get a link directly to the telehealth appointment that they can use at the appointed time. Next. Um, this solution easily drives patients back to practices, scheduling visits to get the care they need, and additionally provides insights into what patients need most. HIPAA-BOT leads to more reimbursable visits in person or telehealth, plus behavioral health screenings. Instead of going straight to the hospital when they have an issue, patients feel connected to the clinicians they already know and are encouraged to schedule visits as needed. It helps clinics who are struggling financially get back to a sustainable number of visits per month. Clinics can set up HIPAA-BOT in minutes and start driving new visits immediately. HIPAA-BOT is priced so that if it drives just three new visits per month, it's worth the investment for clinicians. Next. Dr. McBride is excited to roll this out in her practice first and then use her network of 9,000 US clinicians to roll it out more broadly. Next. Clinicians can set up HIPAA-BOT's SMS messaging in minutes to drive patients to schedule visits. This improves care for patients, keeps clinics financially stable, reduces job loss for healthcare workers, and limits overcrowding of hospitals. Thank you. Great timing, thank you. Maybe we do one question from the judges. Uh, this, this is Michael. The, so there's a, there's a ton of these self-triage tools in the market. I, just to understand more how you're differentiating on, on COVID specifically versus uh, the, lots, of, lots of other companies doing this. Yeah, Babette, can you go to the next slide? And one more. So our competitive advantage is that we're using SMS, which means there's no barrier to patient connection. The setup in minutes, having a plug and play flow that includes things about COVID uh, makes it really easy for clinics to get set up and do this, and it provides additional resources for patients in this time, such as the most up-to-date information on COVID, so they can meet their needs without necessarily needing to talk to a clinician if they don't need a visit right away. Thanks. We have time for one more question. So just very quickly, do you think the, um, so you say the clinicians are actually not that busy and now you want to have the patient use text messages instead. Do you think that creates a closer bond to your physician? Um, we've seen a lot of these services before and triage is not meant to be a personal gain, at least not currently. How do you see that? Yeah, the conversational tone really could foster a clearer sense of connection. And when we asked people in a survey whether they wanted their doctor to reach out in this time via text message and check in on them, 80% of people said yes. And even if it's an automated text message, if it's in the doctor's tone, I think it'll feel like those people are being reached out to and cared for. Even if they don't need a visit, it's a positive point of connection. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Great. Um, <clears throat> up next, smart triage. All right, hello all. You want me to give you the, or you, shall I do the slides? You want me to give you the? Uh, if, you, if you're able to give me control, that'd be great. Otherwise, yeah. let's see. Click to start. Can you do it? Uh, no. You are. It says I am controlling your screen. Which? How do I? Um, okay. 
use my keyboard layout. Uh, I can. If you do your with your mouse, can you use do my no? Yeah, I'm clicking all over. It doesn't seem to be doing. And your mouse doesn't move if even with my mouse now. Uh, if you move your mouse, no, my mouse does not move. Okay. Okay. Sorry, I gave you remote control access, but. That's okay, sure. we can just oh. stay next yeah. slide if that's okay with you. Yeah, that's okay with me. Okay, yes. Okay, go. go. All right, hello all. So our team, Smart Triage, worked together to develop a risk analysis tool to better assist COVID clinics in prioritizing patients while also encouraging them to wait their turn in line at home rather than coming into a cluttered ED. Next slide. So if we imagine a common case, TS is a 62-year-old woman with diabetes and rheumatoid arthritis on methotrexate, and she calls with cough and shortness of breath in the midst of this scary pandemic to her local ED. She also notes chills and is a former smoker. Next slide. So what's the problem here? If she goes to the ED and doesn't have the virus, she's almost certainly to be exposed in a cluttered waiting room and essentially guaranteed infection after that with such a contagious virus. But if she doesn't go to the ED and has the virus and is prone to decompensation, that could be quite dangerous without getting the proper care that she needs. Next slide. Thanks. So what are her options here? How do we make the best clinical decision for this patient while also decreasing waiting room congestion and unnecessary transmission of the virus in the hospital? Next question, next slide. Here's where our SARS model comes in. We performed a meta-analysis of the most recent data from the most prestigious medical journals and performed a logistic regression analysis based on the variables that you see on the right, which are predictive, either positively or negatively, of ICU bed necessity. Next slide. So back to our case, our 62-year-old woman with multiple risk factors calls her COVID hotline or ER receptionist, and the receptionist simply uses our web-based calculator and punches in her basic history information, easily communicated over the phone, generating her SARS risk score of 34.9, indicating moderately high risk. Next slide. Uh, forward, two. Uh, one more. Ah, uh, thank you. Um, so her score is immediately compared to others presenting to the same ED or COVID clinic. You can see that she's about middle of the pack, indicating that she won't be the first to be seen, but she also won't be the last. Next slide. As patients are seen, she gra gradually progresses up the list. Next slide. And from home, she can monitor in real time her current standing relative to the ED's waiting list on the basis of her risk and the flow of the ED. That way, she can best estimate when she should come to the emergency room and how long to wait at home. We imagine a three-step approach to implementation. First, we wanna integrate incoming data as we learn more about the risk factors for this virus to train an AI model as we move away from our basic statistical model. We wanna develop a user-friendly webpage and run a pilot study in a series of small hospitals to demonstrate feasibility and efficacy in decluttering their waiting rooms. And finally, we wanna scale the model widespread. Next slide. We believe that we're uniquely positioned to scale this model quickly because we are a purely software-based approach and in, in addition, a purely web-based approach. There's no hardware or limiting thing to distribute and it would be incredibly cheap so that hospitals could pick up and begin to use this software in the click of a mouse by simply visiting our webpage and adopting the calculator into their workflow. In addition, moving forward, we wanna to expand to multiple languages uh, and be able to in, in, eventually add phone bots if receptionists become overwhelmed. Next slide. All right, so I'd like to thank our team for all of their contributions and MIT for hosting the event and welcome any questions from the judges. Thank you. Okay, first question. I have, I have a question. Um, so I think it's really great you're standardizing the sort of ICU bed eligibility. Um, my question is, have you talked to any emergency physicians about how they would see something like this? We have a registered nurse with us who is on front line of COVID-19. Becky, you would like to answer? Yes, actually, uh, I work in the front line in the Miami, Florida area as a COVID team uh, front line nurse. And um, I do think that this is going to be able to incorporate it with our daily operation because um, for the vulnerable gen gen uh, population, we'll just go ahead and give them a waiting time. And then we already have our hospital empty out all the um, parking garage. So they pretty much just wait in the car and once it's time for them, we'll just have them in the car 
and bring them to the uh, 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 ER for further treatment. Of course, we've got a great, like a quick few second assessment, look at the patient. Is it what they claim is match up to what they look like? So we do put in the subjective and the objective together and give a quick assessment and give them a number on the priority. So they're not waiting for a lot of uh, geriatric patients coming here. They don't know that is waiting for um, five or 10 hours. We are so also providing a self-assessment so the patient do not directly need to rush into a ER or directly call the hotline, which is already busy. So the person can also get his score and then he can decide whether he needs to go to the ER or not. Thank so you, thank you. For okay. the of the people. What does the, uh, the implementation look like with existing systems? Is it something that would be easy to do? How quickly would you get this into a clinic? We can get a brief, brief answer. We are almost at our time. Yeah, sure. We just need to develop the web-based approach, which is really easy. We can scale it over a cloud, and then it's just a click-based system. The where hospitals just need to go over the web page, and then they can start using it. The web-based service providers like Amazon Web Services, they provide the database and everything. We can integrate it real quick. Great. Thank, Thank you so much. One last Thank thing. Thank you very much. Multi uh, vulnerable uh, population accessibility. So people who have like speech, uh, speech problem or anything will be able to incorporate that. Thank you. Yes. Great. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Please mute yourself um, after you're done. Thank you. Great. Um, I think our next team is COVID social, but I don't think we had their slides. So let's see. Otherwise, Swaskasi, also be ready. Hey, I just got them, but I don't have time to put them in the deck. So do you want to put them at the end? Yes. Or do you... Yeah, let's do it at the okay. end. Okay. okay. Got it. Swatskazi, are you ready? Uh, hello. Hello. Yes. Uh, I'm Swatskazi. Uh, can you please tell me when we start? Yes, yeah, you can start. Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we live in interesting times, and in times like these, we wonder what is more contagious, the disease or the panic? Next slide. So if we look around, the current scenario is overwhelmed with overburdened healthcare system and a shortage of testing kits. But a problem which comes before that is that we lack a mechanism to profile patients or screen patients as to who needs to be tested. Next slide. So this is why we thought we could uh, leverage voice biomarker technology to address this issue. This technology has been shown to be effective in detecting pneumonia and other symptoms 80% of the times. And since 68% of the patients show cough as a symptom for COVID, this can be a 100% non-invasive and remote solution to this. Next slide. Uh, so let me introduce to you CoronaBot. Accessible, scalable, and reliable. Next slide. So how does this work? This is a WhatsApp, this is a bot which is integrated in WhatsApp. It records patient history, which is age, location, symptoms, and comorbidities, along with a sample of their cough sound. Then using an AI-based voice biomarker technology, we screen and recommend patients. Next slide. So some of the salient features of this app, uh, of this bot are it's integrated in WhatsApp, which gives us a very heavy competitive advantage because of the high penetration of WhatsApp. Uh, it is multilingual, so we can launch it anywhere, uh, given that this pandemic is global and not just national, and we can get location insights, which can help us make informed choices. Next slide. So uh, CoronaBot aims to help three key stakeholders, the people, the hospitals, and the government. Next slide. Our, our value proposition to the people is we provide them real-time monitoring and at-home screening, which helps them reduce and manage their panic. Less panic means less people running to the hospital, which eases the burden on the hospital. And with people and hospitals intact, the government can get insights and they can actually manage this pandemic better. Next slide. So we already have our roadmap planned out. Uh, development, beta testing, model training, pilot, fundraising, and then launch. We have completed uh, successfully in this three days, the first two steps. And we have also identified a potential, yeah, the slide's fine. We have identified uh, potential partners from, this, uh, from our sponsors who can help us get to our goal. Uh, next slide. So like I mentioned, our beta testing went live a few hours ago. And within uh, a time frame of three hours, we got 200 plus responses. This, if you look at the demographic, these responses were from, from some of the cities, which are very heavily hit in South Asia right now. Uh, next slide. 
And if you look at the age of people who are responding, majority, 94 percent of the people uh, stayed within 18 to 64 years. Uh, this is the population which either is asymptomatic and is spreading the disease or is symptomatic and needs care. So we are reaching our target population. Next slide. Um, our team is uh, very well equipped to solve this problem because we have expertise in healthcare, speech recognition, uh, product, uh, product and entrepreneurship, business, uh, and data science. Uh, and we have mentors who are actually solving these problems in uh, a, couple of, a couple of countries, uh, which makes me confident that we can take this to its, uh, to its final launch by the, before summer. Thank you very much. Thank you, great. Okay, one question from one of the judges. This is Michael. What, what information do you have to indicate that there's a unique clinical signal from the corona cough? Uh, the, there, uh, there are some research, uh, research papers right now which, says, uh, which say that 68% of uh, the corona samples, uh, corona positive patients, show a very, very specific uh, cough, uh, cough, dry cough. And... Uh, CMU, uh, Stanford, and a lot of other schools and a lot of uh, companies are individually collecting a lot of data. And uh, this has already been, uh, this model has already been launched in China and Korea to identify and screen patients. So that is our validation study. Uh, we have uh, time for one more question. Casper here. Um, I believe that the validation is there also for the cough uh, to some extent. The, my question is more, have you built that model? Um, because you would need uh, patients that actually have the virus and their cough to build it, right? Yes. So our for our beta testing, we have also like uh, we are all, we have also reached out to a hospital in uh, Mumbai, India, which which is test which is a test center for uh, the highest uh, for corona positive patients. Uh, we have partners who will uh, who are uh, frontline health healthcare workers who will be helping us get like cough samples from people who we know are positive, and that's what we are integrating and training our model on. So basically, before you can implement, you would need to build the model around patient samples, right? And that's also what you're gathering from the beta. So what's the yes. expectations on when you would be have, a, have a model that could be put uh, in? So uh, the, some, uh, our mentor, uh, Kuldeep Singh, uh, ha already has this, he's the CEO of Bioformis. They have already made the model and they have launched this model in uh, China and South Korea. And we hope to like collaborate with them and either give the data to them and like make the model around that or get data from them and like within a period of like two weeks, make the model working. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. We're out of time. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Um, next up is Corona Home. Ooh, we don't have slides, so I think we're gonna skip over them. Team Pool Party, are you ready? We're ready, can you hear me? Yes, great. Okay, so we're gonna ask you to control the slides if that's okay. Yeah, that's okay. Okay, so hi everyone. We at Pool Party are connecting at-home patients with volunteer medical professionals. Let's start with a problem. Next slide. There are 31 million low-income Americans that depend on smaller community cl clinics for their care, but only 38% of these clinics offer telehealth services, leaving these vulnerable populations without access to at-home care during this COVID crisis. So where's our opportunity? Next slide. What you see here is a colored representation of peak COVID hospital demand by state. Because the peak times are different, the demand for medical professional support will be staggered, creating capacity sharing opportunities that are currently constrained by geographic location. In addition, there is sustained capacity for non-practicing professionals and specialized practitioners who cannot support the front line. Next slide. Our solution is a website called Pool Party that matches that excess capacity with rising telehealth demands. The platform connects validated volunteer medical professionals with at-home patients for one-time unofficial COVID-related consultations. Patients will describe their concerns, which eliminates the need for medical records, while the support provided will ease patient concerns and prevent unnecessary ER visits. And because this service is volunteer-based and free for patients, it reduces a barrier of entry for low-income, vulnerable populations. Now let's talk through a, a use case. Next slide, please. Kelly is a 42-year-old bus driver who was recently laid off. She's worried because she is short on cash but has flu-like symptoms. Pool Party allows her to select Connect Now, schedule a session, or submit a Q&A ticket. Because of her immediate discomfort, she selects Call Now. Using our platform, she is connected to Laura, a 28-year-old pediatric nurse who is at home while her team is de-staffed. 
Laura accepts a connection and the two meet via the web app. Laura walks Kelly through her concerns and Kelly is assuaged that she can continue monitoring her symptoms from home. Next. To get started, we will prove our concept on a small scale community demo. Once we have shown that providers and patients are using our platform, we plan to scale additionally across regions in the United States. To recruit an initial batch of medical professionals who will work with the United States Mar Marine Medical Reserve Corps groups to find those who are willing to serve in this time of need. Then to launch our free platform to patients, we will work with local community groups such as the New York City Department of Social Services. Next slide. Initially, we plan on using $50,000 to support marketing, administrative, and technical needs over a six-month timeline. Because we are providing an efficient service on a, to a short-term problem, we anticipate this level of funding is well within the amount that can be provided by a startup grant, such as those provided by the Martin Trust or the New York Community Trust. Next slide. Our team has a diverse background, including software development, business, and medical experience. Next slide. We are excited to launch our platform and look forward to answering your guys' questions. Great, thank you. Okay, first question. Could you talk a little bit about why this solution in particular addresses the challenge of poor penetration of telehealth solutions for the communities that you talked about? Yeah, certainly. <clears throat> so I think one thing that makes us very encouraged about the ability of this solution to penetrate into those communities is the fact that many uh, low-income Americans actually do own smartphones. So 71% uh, of Americans with incomes less than $30,000 actually have smartphones uh, that they have access to. Uh, similarly, similarly, Americans in the next highest, higher income bracket uh, have about 78% of them have access to smartphones. So that's really the barrier to entry for a patient to be able to access this service. And we feel like there's a, a good segment of patients that can do this. One, we have one more time for one more question. Uh, equivalent question on the supply side. Why, why would a physician choose this network than a rapid sign up with Amwell, Teladoc, take your pick? Uh, sure, certainly. So I think, you know, one thing that's uh, very compelling about this particular solution is the fact that uh, low income Amer Americans who don't have another option uh, will be helped by this solution. So speaking with uh, you know, a nurse in Ohio who gave us some input as we were scoping out our solution. She said that she really feels a calling based on the fact that there's so many underserved communities and she would love to volunteer her extra time for something like this. Uh, a service like Amwell would really be integrated with an existing health system where there would be, you know, normal paying patients who may not uh, really need to go to a low cost solution like this one. Thank you so much. Great. Okay. Our, no. um, our next team, Norona. Can you hear me? Yes, I read, right. we can. Okay, cool. Okay, whenever you're ready. Yeah, just a second. Um, okay, cool. Are we ready? Yeah. Okay, so okay. we're Nerona, and we're offering a frugal approach, approach to at-home triage. Next slide, please. Okay. Imagine a patient experiencing shortness of breath, coughing, and tiredness. In any other time, these ambiguous symptoms would warrant a trip to CVS, some Tylenol, and a likely correct amateur flu diagnosis. Now, however, it could be much worse. But the flu hasn't disappeared, nor has pneumonia, nor have allergies, all of which could ostensibly be mistaken for COVID-19 by an anxious person. So what is someone to do? go to a hospital and risk exposure. Clearly there is a need for an at-home solution that can one, distribute quickly, two, increase the information available to physicians, and three, assuage fears effectively. Next slide. Studies have shown that COVID can pre present with a relatively unique breathing sound described as having Velcro crackle character as seen in these spectrograms. You can see the COVID spectrogram has um, high frequency characteristics. Next slide, please. Oh, okay. Well, we had a video, but um, luckily, virtually everyone is carrying. That's fine. You don't have to go through it. Yeah. Virtually everyone is carrying high quality audio recording hardware right in their pocket in the form of their smartphone and attached earphones. 
Through simplicity and ease of access, we hope to empower people to generate their health data themselves on a scale not possible with solutions limited by logistics. Here you can see the DIY hardware we've produced. The prototype is made of simple household materials. For example, here saran wrap is acting as a rudimentary diaphragm. The device can be constructed in four easy steps and the mic is non-destructively co-opted from a pair of cheap earphones. And the signal is sent straight to our web app. Next slide. Anyone can build this device in 15 minutes and our team members have proven this. The method of data processing uh, makes the design very forgiving, even for those not confident in their arts and crafts skills. This is an example that one of our team members made in 15 minutes. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, well. Three, uh, Baba, can you go to slide nine and do um, actually click on the link? Because this is yeah, our. We have a. Go to slide nine. Next one, next one, next, next. Yeah, click on the link, that one. Yeah. Yeah. So this yeah. is that. So Let's click Let's Begin. Yeah, so here you can see uh, the prototype of our um, home testing kit. And you can see instructions for building your own stethoscope as long as a video demo for you to follow along. There is a, if you scroll down a bit. Yeah, there's a prompt to record a sound via a microphone and specific stethoscope placement on the body is indicated clearly on a diagram. We'll walk you through every step of taking this measurement. Can you click um, on Breathe? Yeah. Hello. And then can you try to breathe into the microphone? Bye -bye. Yeah, so you can see it's registering sound in the frequency domain. Um, so this data can be easily processed by image uh, machine learning for later analysis. And additionally, the process data can be downloaded for personal use or sent to a doctor at a later time. Um, you can click stop on the top. Scroll up a little bit, click stop, oh, down a little bit. Yeah. To achieve a holistic assessment, a basic questionnaire about comorbidities and risk factors follows if you scroll down. Uh, ultimately, the results from the model can be displayed for the user. So if you scroll down and click next. Um, click click um, next again. Yeah. Um, can you go to the bottom? Sorry, go to the, go to the top, go to the top and click um, let's begin um, to the top, most top. Click um, up. top, 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 um, to the top. Yeah, and then click let's begin and then go back to the bottom and click next. Um, click again and then go to the bottom, click next. Yeah. Oh. Um, that's fine. It's not optimized yeah, for Safari, yeah. but um, sorry guys. Ultimately, a results page um, can be displayed for the user, informing them of any qualitative abnormalities their breathing presented, which are usually um, characterized by a physician, such as crackling and rasp. Additionally, advice for next steps are provided, and educational materials, including uh, videos, are provided. Could we go back to the slides? Yeah. So next slide. Yeah, if we were given resources to expand, the scalability and simplicity of this idea would naturally lend itself to increased accuracy, collaboration, and integration with existing triage tools. Um, Thanks yeah. for your time. Baba, can you click on the link in the chat box? There is the result page that we wanted to show you. So in the chat box, I posted the link. Yeah, so yeah, where you can carry on with the result. Yeah, so here you see those qualitative um, metrics that are usually reserved for physicians listening on a stethoscope, but um, hopefully with enough data or machine learning, I mean, it's proven that machine learning can characterize these stethoscope sounds. So yeah, thank you for your time. Great, thank you. Sorry for the no inconvenience. Um, we are a little bit over time, so one, one question, short question from the judges. Sure. I have a question. Uh, have you guys talked to any pulmonologists about uh, how this sort of uh, input would guide clinical care? Uh, we talked to one physician and she was telling us about how um, really it's the first sort of line of defense when seeing a new patient is, you know, this basic uh, stethoscope test. Sometimes it's 
so re- like there's lots of variability obviously with COVID, but um, when people present, um, and we, we showed one of the recordings to somebody and it's, it's similar to what's collected by professional level um, digital stethoscopes. And so we got rough guidance that it would be helpful. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Greg. Um, more prototypes. Um, next team up is Team Firewall. Um, so good morning, I'm Suchitra and I would be representing the Team Firewall. So I'd like to begin with a story. So Katrina has a pre-existing condition that mandates her to go to the hospital a few times a week. She starts developing, she starts coughing and develops a slight temperature. Panicking at the thought that it might be COVID, she rushes to the ED. Due to the overcrowding, she's made to wait longer than usual, increasing her chance of getting a nosocomial infection, only to find out that it's just a flu. Next slide. This, scene, this scenario is seen so often that it has become problematic. My team members themselves have relatives who have to visit the hospital on a weekly basis for dialysis, chemotherapy, and some of who are diabetic. These individuals being immunocompromised are at a greater risk of contracting COVID-19. Unfortunately, they can't forego entering these high-risk situations. Next slide. Um, as of March 28th, it was reported that 5.8% of the total number of COVID-19 cases in the U.S. have, a, have an underlying health condition. A study conducted in 2008 showed that 3.6% of the U- US population are immunocompromised, which is 10 million people, and the number has only increased. How can we help track their overall risk and symptoms to prevent them from getting exposed to these hazards? So this is where Firewall comes in. Um, next slide. We plan to create a platform that guides the individual to, through, to, uh, through two things, a self-assessment questionnaire and a pre-screening test, such as a pulse oximeter. A respiratory distress is the single most important indicator of COVID-19, and a pulse oximeter does exactly that. It measures the percent oxygen saturation in blood and the pulse rate. It is an inexpensive, reusable, non-invasive, and very easy to use. It is already widely used by respiratory and cardiac patients from their home. Um, Next slide. So a combination of these two would help differentiate the individual into three categories, green, yellow, or red. So green would be when the pulse oximeter reading is greater than or equal to 90 and the questionnaire score is lesser than three. Yellow when the reading is between 80 to 89 and the questionnaire score is between three to five. Red is when the reading was lesser than 80 and the questionnaire score is greater than or equal to six. Um, Next slide. So when the status is red, a signal is sent to the nearby testing site or a hospital. The concerned individuals will then come to collect their samples. This will help hospitals manage their staff and equipment well ahead. So we've created a prototype website that would give you an idea of how the firewall would work, which is what we have been displayed. Uh, The main advantage of this is the fact that the self-assessment monitoring can be done at the comfort uh, comfort of home. Um, Next slide. Um, Due to the increasing count of and limitation in COVID-19 test kits, the usage must be well-defined. The graph here indicates that the number of tests that results as negative is almost four times the number of positive cases. There is also a huge backlog of sam- samples that is yet to be tested. So this is where firewall create is, plays a crucial role. So the stakeholder, stakeholders in this project, the insurance company would buy the device at a subsidized rate from the manufacturing companies and ship it off to the hospitals from where the patients can get it when they visit for their routine checkups. So there are multiple activities, um, next slide, there are multiple activities Um, to be taken care during implementation, which is uh, what is mentioned here. So collect data, plan implementation, implement, and then- You're at, sorry, I have to go. You're at three minutes, so quickly wrap it up. Yeah, um, I'm done. So the approach is to implement for for a sample hospital, understand the outcome, and then improve it in the other areas. Um, Thank you. If you have any questions. Yeah, question, yeah, thank you so much. Um, So the patients get it from the routine checkups. Would that put them at risk already, or what's the plan to get it into the hands of patients as quickly as possible? Um, so our main issue here that we're focusing on is immunocompromised patients. For example, cancer patients who have to go to the hospital for their chemotherapy irrespective of the virus. So when they do attend these sessions, for example, or a dialysis patient, somebody who has to undergo dialysis once in two weeks. So when they do come in for their session, so um, the device would be given to them. Or the hospital staff could also collect data of who and all the who the number of immunocompromised patients in that particular area, and um, the staff could also go and deliver it to their houses if that's possible. 
Thank you. One time for one more brief question. Okay. Then, thank you so much. We're thank going. You. Thanks. Thank you. Our next team is, let's see, Kenovian, Kenovians. Oh uh, yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, I'm from, uh, I'm, my, my name Great. is Anto and I'm from India. Uh, so I represent my team, Kenovians. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so let me first address the problem that we are trying to uh, give a solution for. See, uh, one of the most important reasons uh, the coronavirus gets uh, transmitted so fastly is because of fomites. Uh, fomites, uh, when I say fomites, it's um, when an infected person touches an object, he leaves behind traces of the virus, which can last up to 72 hours, uh, so that it can easily uh, spread to other people who come in contact with the fomites. So this is one of the main, uh, most important reasons the virus is uh, getting transmitted so fast across countries. Next slide, please. Um, here's a vis visual res representation of how the formats get uh, trans uh, transmitted from one person to the another. Uh, next slide, please. So we have come up with a solution um, in order to keep track of uh, how many times you, uh, keep track of uh, your habit of touching your face. See, whenever you come in contact with formates, uh, the virus still has to find a way of uh, gaining entry into your body. And you, do, uh, you um, uh, when you touch your face, uh, uh, it, it, it gets obviously easier for the virus to gain entry into your body through your nose or the mouth. So we have, uh, we have come, up with a, come up with a solution, which is an alert system that alerts you whenever you uh, raise your hand in order to touch your face. Next slide, please. Um, in our solution, we try to implement an RFID-based uh, uh, RFID based vibrator. Uh, it consists of uh, two devices. One is a uh, wristband that you can wear on your wrist, and another will be a pendant or a necklace that you can wear around your neck. So whenever you try to touch your face, uh, your, uh, your hand obviously has to uh, go, go through the proximity of the pendant. So that uh, when the RFID system, uh, the RFID system basically has a receiver and a transmitter, right? The wristband will be having an RFID tag, which will uh, communicate with the receiver, which is embedded in the necklace. So that uh, when your hand moves up uh, and it tr uh, and you try to touch your face, uh, the RFID system communicates. Uh, uh, the communication happens between the receiver and the transmitter. And finally, a vibration, a vibration interface is um, given to the wristband so that uh, the vibration can alert that you are going to touch your face so that you can actually keep track of uh, how many times you are uh, touching your face. Next, next slide, please. Next slide, next slide. So uh, I, I have to address uh, uh, who whom we are tar targeting. Next next slide, please. So you're uh, at the, uh, three minutes. So please round yeah, it off. Uh, I just need. Uh, uh, there are, there are still countries which are not in complete lockdown, like Sweden, and people are still uh, and there are essential workers who need to work even amidst lockdown. So there is a greater chance for these people to get infected because of formates uh, rather than uh, getting infected because of direct contact. Uh, since uh, it's already, people are aware enough already to practice social distancing. So formates is one of the most important reasons uh, why the virus is um, still uh, transmitting at a higher rate. Next slide. Sorry, I have to stop you here. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, any questions from the judges? But just so I understand, so it's a tool to understand how many times you touch your face, right? What's the... Uh, 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 not, not exactly how many times you, uh, you touch your face. It's an alert system that alerts you whenever you are going to touch your face. So yeah. you can basically refrain from doing so. Yes, okay. And what does the rollout plan look like? Uh, come again. The rollout plan, how do you want to implement it? Uh, we are going to implement it uh, with the help of a wristband and uh, pendant that can be worn around the neck. So uh, an RFID based system is going to be implemented uh, in the wristband and the uh, necklace uh, and, and the pendant. 
So whenever you raise your hand, uh, the wristband is going to be in the proximity of the pendant which will be having the receiver. So the passively charged stack is going to get activated so that it, uh, can, con it can communicate with the vibrator which is going to inform you uh, of that action. Okay, just very quickly. It's more about how do you get it in the hands of the user? Um, actually, uh, the uh, accessibility has been one of the most important things that we have uh, given our interests to, and we are trying. We we can manufacture this uh, for a cost of um, around fifteen dollars, so it's really low cost, right? So um, we we still haven't. Uh, I mean, we have come up with manufacturing ideas, but we, we still haven't implemented that uh, through companies. So we're trying to do that. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Next, Team Confident. So that just really quickly for the judges, would you mind just um, pasting the team name into the chat so that we can put it into the Google Forms more easily? Yeah. Thank you. And sorry, what was the name of that last team? Team Kenopians, I will put it in the, or maybe um, could each team that's presenting, could you put, as soon as you start presenting, one person of your team put in your, in the chat your team name? Let's see if that works. So this next team is Confidant. This is not Confidant. This is not our slides. Can you check those, please? Go back. Okay. Yep, that's not us. Okay. No, that's not us either. Oh, then we don't have your slides in here. Okay. Is this team Goa? Yeah. Okay, I'm um, sorry, Team Confident. Um, please contact our slides. Okay, um, please contact uh, Nancy, and she will manage with you, and then we'll reschedule you. I'm sorry. Um, okay, something must have gone wrong there. Team Goa. Yeah. Is this you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In New York. Sorry, uh, Scott. Okay. Um, so now up is Team Goa. Oh, sorry. One second. Okay. Um, yes. Sorry, we're ready. Yeah, so we basically want to present this Gramin Samban. It's a self-assessment network for COVID-19 in rural regions of developing nations, basically. Can we go to the next slide? We have information on the screen. One more? Yeah. So basically, the problem we have is that people in rural areas have A, minimal internet access, and B, low electricity rates. Do we still need to educate them about COVID-19 and provide them with ways to home triage, basically? So, yeah. yeah. So the current uh, urgency of the situation is that right now we have an unprecedented amount of people, thousands of workers, moving from cities back to their native villages due to a sudden nationwide lockdown that we had, I think, about 14 days ago. And this has raised a lot of uh, fear about community transmission going rampant in the country, especially the rural zones. So we've chosen to focus on rural India because of this, and also because the uh, rural India is 65, 69 to 65% of the total population that we have, as well as you know low smartphone, low internet penetration, and uh, there is more, as well as low literacy rates as well as uh, inadequate medical infrastructure and equipment available to people. So there are medical workers in the country who are going door to door, finding out information about coronavirus and trying to track its spread. And they don't need, they, you know, they do all of this without even basic PP masks or hand sanitizer provided to them. So we definitely have like a problem here and we wanted to address it. And could you go to the next slide? Yeah. 
the way we wanted to do this was to implement a system that enables asha workers asha workers are basically a government uh, trained it's an initiative by the government where we have local workers females basically in every local rural community already in touch with the community so we wanted to give provide them with tech to assist with at home triage patient triage as well as monitor rural communities using you know mobile applications we've developed and calling bots we'd hope to give them and also give them partial access to the aadhar identity database the aadhar identity database is a a, a government run database that has basic information about of you know medically relevant information of about 90% of india's population so with these tools we want to assist you know help them out basically with the current crisis can you go next to the next slide so the way the system would work is uh, you get a call from your service provider using the aadhar database provided a, se a section of the aadhar database you select the language since india is a multilingual country you select the language you want the exchange to take place in if you have a smartphone you directly get an app like a link to download an app and you'd have to do the preliminary test through the app and there'd be incentives to finish the test no doubt if the app thinks that you are at like a possible risk of infection they report you straight to the asha worker now if you don't have a smartphone we'd connect you to a preliminary call test through a bot and uh, if the bot decides that you could have a uh, risk of infection then they take you to an asha worker you're at 3 again, minutes so please yeah. round it off yeah another asha worker would uh, use a database for high risk can you go to the next slide Yes. Yeah, so we have an app. Basically, can you go through it? That helps ASHA workers track patients, and it provides individualized health cards for them also to track symptoms throughout a period of time for each patient they have referred to them. Can you go next? Okay. Yeah, we also have an independent uh, an, um, an independent smartphone app, which is uh, basically meant for people to again track their symptoms for them to take preliminary tests as well as act, access you know government resources that we can uh, provide okay. as much as we. Right. Yeah. Right here. I have to finish you here. Yeah. The time uh, is up. No, sorry. Yeah, time is up. Uh, also no, sorry. It's any one question from the judges. This is Michael. Question would would. Are you saying this has to be a, a, uh, executed by a, a public health service, or this could be uh, executed by a nonprofit or a smaller organization? Could you actually get oh, to so the big thing? Is we didn't we do not want it to be an you know a proper using medical personnel because we have a shortage of medical personnel. We want this to be the gap between people panicking and approaching the medical personnel and staying at home and accessing relevant information. Okay. Thank you. Thanks team Gao. Up next. Up next we have team Covido app. Hello. Gab, please let us know when we can uh, we can start. Yes. Um so that's going to be me and my team member energy. I just hope he's on. Yeah, hi. Okay, perfect. All right, can we start? Uh, one second. Uh, yes, please start. Hi, everyone. Uh, my team is going to pitch for a solution that helps with at-home triage. Uh, we bring to you an at-home risk assessment app called Covido. For beta testing, our target population are the elderly. Next slide. Next slide again. So COVID-19 is a rampant infection as in the graph, irrespective of the city, the total number of deaths in an infected population nearly doubles every 10 years of age post 50. So this segment of the population that is the elderly are very vulnerable and being mindful about social distancing and overwhelmed healthcare facilities and an increasing use of smartphones by, the, by our elders, we need more frequent smart at-home risk assessments. Next slide. These are some examples of how community members from all over the world are helping the elderly. Very similarly, my team member Nurjeet and his wife who are based in Berlin put up notes offering to help in this time of crisis. Inspired by this, Nurjeet is now gonna take over and tell us how the app helps. Next slide. 
So the app basically is a reflection of uh, what we've done is we've built uh, our app over the weekend, which it's ready, uh, around home assessment and keeping the UX for elderly in, in picture. It's a simple UI with, with layman languages being used. Uh, so the second important component of the app is the neighborhood help where volunteers can sign up and elderly people can ask for help around the grocery shopping, going to pharmacy or just for a walk. And we are connecting other services which, which could be helpful for them. We are not building them prop, uh, basically connecting to hotline 911 services, telemedicine app and other, other important services they can use. Uh, can you go to the next one? It is a quick solution demo, the app is ready. So we will be probably launching it next week. Can you go back? Uh, let's just yeah. Say, yeah. This is what we have. Okay, can you still hear me? Yeah. Okay, so I'm in general trouble. Can you go to the next slide? So uh, where do we want to go? It's basically, I was just looking at other pre pitches. So it's basically, we want to have a self-learning algorithm, which improves over the period when more research is established. Uh, and we also wanted to do the recognition of the cuff type when the patient cuffs in the mic, uh, which is where I think the first copy could, uh, could be a good uh, partner for us. Let, next slide. So this is a business model where we want to kind of have on one side, uh, make it uh, like the doctor will prescribe this app to the patient and uh, the insurances are going to pay for it as a reimbursement. And the other side, we want to have a partner like pharma companies or uh, telemedicine apps where we can drive traffic for, for these, uh, these products. Next slide. Um, your time is up. Yeah, this is our team, which is a, a mixed team of uh, uh, developers, uh, medical, uh, this thing. And uh, I personally am a healthcare uh, I've been working in healthcare innovation. Next slide. Sorry, we have to sure. round it Go off. Ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. That's fine. And this is a cut off our technical architecture we've created. Next slide. That's it. Great. Thank you. Hi, this, is, this is Ryan. Um, thank you. That was great. So, my question is how do you drive patient compliance? That seems to be an issue here. How do you drive patients? Can you repeat that? Patient compliance. Patient complaint. Compliance. How do you get the patients to use your app? App ah, patient compliance. So the idea was that to leverage uh, uh, one thing, uh, the caregivers to uh, get to uh, use this app and help them set this up. Second thing is we, we want to leverage volunteers, which we already started, uh, who are already helping these elderly to spread the message of how they can use this app. So we have around 100 plus volunteers who are already working with elderly in Berlin. Thank you. We have time. One more question. So just quickly, is the product then based towards the elderly or towards the, the care? I mean, it just, it changes a lot based on what the UX is going to be and, and all that. So the use itself will be done by, uh, by the elderly. So the UX will be very heavily focused on that. Uh, but the onboarding them would be through care caregivers. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Thank you, team. All right. Thank you. Please mute yourself again. Okay. Great. Our next team. Uh, hi. Uh, am okay. I audible? Yes, you're audible. Could you please state your team name? Yeah, uh, my team name is uh, IATG uh, Neural Lab. Uh, my team name has entered it in the chat. Okay, yes, great. Thank you. Okay, so uh, next slide, please. Yeah. So uh, consider a normal, uh, like non-medical student named uh, John. So John, as everyone is doing it during this time, he's scared about the coronavirus and he doesn't have any like uh, I'm sorry previous slide please. Yeah, sure. Like he doesn't have any uh, awareness of what the disease is and how like what are the symptoms that are uh, given by the disease, and uh, he can't approach the hospital as well as the, there are uh, there's a risk 
in getting infected from the from the hospital places and uh, many people like john john they they can't uh, go to the hospital at the same time for the symptoms as well as uh, they may overcoat the system and uh, also like uh, exhaust the testing resources the next slide please uh, so what we are doing is that uh, in with respect to the market uh, the current apps that are there they ask the uh, <coughs> Uh, they ask the subjects to uh, like enter their symptoms and what they are uh, to, and all the signals and the age and their uh, predominant characteristics etc and depending upon the risk that they calculate from their entries they like uh, say the risk if they want uh, have to visit to an uh, hospital or uh, they can self quarantine but our solution is that instead of like take, uh, taking the patient's uh, parameters we are uh, use we have created a app called covid meter which can be which can just be switched on and kept in uh, in the front pocket next slide please uh, the covid app it uh, records the uh, audio and uh, audio and video uh, signals from the patient and it uh, uses machine uh, it extracts the coughs that uh, the from the audio uh, recorded and it uh, characterizes the audio as dry or a uh, wet cough and it uh, calculates the risk that the patient may have for uh, covid next slide please so these are the uh, references that we have referred to for uh, calculating this which uh, which is a machine learning for algorithms for uh, cal uh, for predicting uh, coughs that is characterizing coughs next so our current work plan is that we we have uh, currently building uh, the model for uh, uh, detecting the coughs from the uh, continuous audio data and after we have done that we would proceed with uh, creating a model for uh, risk calculation uh, after which we shall uh, integrate it into an uh, android app and the android android app shall shall uh, calculate the risk score and uh, advise the patient on if they need to visit the hospital or if they are far, far, they can like stay at home for some time until uh, more uh, like predominant symptoms are visible next slide please yeah this is the current team we are with uh, and the next week. thank you thank you any questions from the judges this is michael i just I'm, I'm not sure if i caught it but what's the what's the distribution or business model behind this would this be done on behalf of a provider organization is it entirely consumer driven how do you imagine uh, the distribution business model uh, the distribution like uh, we aim this for the general population at least the, up to the for the poor class it is uh, for whom they they don't have a smartphone it is hard but the basic prerequisites is a smartphone with a my work, working microphone and a video camera so like uh, at least in like so that is our aiming population okay any other questions what we have time for one more just quickly on the data for the model, have you been able to um, to attract any partners to support you there? Uh, for that uh, for that question, I'd like to uh, ask my uh, teammate, uh, Dr. Navin Gupta, to answer the question. Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. I mean, am I audible? Yes. Yes, sir. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for the opportunity and the question. Yeah, I mean, we are directly working with uh, of the medical colleges, uh, I mean, around the university. So we hope to probably, once we finish uh, building up the model and the algorithms, and we're able to sort of get a crude prototype, we plan to test it with uh, our hospital partners. Great. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Awesome. Up next, go in 20. Yes. Um, am I audible? Yes, you are. Okay. May I begin? Yes, you may begin. Okay. So we are, our serv the service that we offer is called COVID-20 and it's real-time health assessment system for vulnerable population. Next. The problem is that elderly and vulnerable population, when they have basic symptoms, they panic and they rush to the hospital and overburden it. And it's not just these individuals who panic, but also their family members who mostly rush them to the hospital. So how do we provide them self and remote assessment to triage them and 
eventually like with the final goal of reducing the burden on hospitals. Please uh, note that this is in the Indian scenario. Next. Um, as you can see in the slide, the um, current area of self-assessment and real-time assessment is pretty crowded, but the gap lies in terms of internet accessibility and accessibility in general to the mode of assessment. So the unique selling point of ours is that is that we, um, I, I actually think this slide is an old one. We updated it a little bit after that, but um, uh, the, the thing is that we offer real-time at-home self-assessment, which gives not just you information, but also your family. It is remote as well as self-assessment. Next. Uh, the way our service goes is that it partners with government and health departments and NGOs in India, and that's how an elderly person will find out about it. Next. Um, then COVID sends a tracking product to their uh, house. Next. This tracking product is number one, a pillow which senses uh, heart rate, respiratory rate, blood pressure, body temperature. Um, so these are the vitals that it tests and it can, it has an LED light that starts uh, blinking if it crosses a certain vital. They're made of memory foam, so they're even better for your health and it's chargeable. Next. There's also a mask which tests the same parameters and serves the additional purpose of uh, pre uh, preventing spread. Next. Uh, so it monitors vitals at home. Next. And it, the thing is that it sends feedback of your symptoms to the elderly person on their phone via downloading an application and or to their family who may be with them or far away worrying about them. And it also sends feedback of symptoms to the COVID authorities who are frontline authorized healthcare um, uh, individuals. Next. Here's an example of the app. So as you can see, this is, this is what's visible to the elderly person if they're getting feedback about their symptoms. So it shows their body temperature. It gives them their signs, but not in a way that they panic and rush to the hospital. Next. These alerts can be given similar to Amber alerts, but to calm them down, they also have access to the rest of the data. Next. This is an example of the feedback that's given to the family. Next. Who they also have access to their uh, data of the elderly person. Next. This is the uh, data that's visible to the back end COVID. So they can see all their data and they can see the data of all the individuals. And if a data is extreme, then it starts blinking. And here we have it, the human touch. So now the human to that specific individual whose vitals have crossed a certain parameter, they can actually contact them separately and tell them to calm down so that they don't run to the hospital. Here we've established trust. So it's not just tech, it's human. Next. Um, if the symptoms get worse, COVID can contact telehealth uh, systems and it can connect telehealth to the person's house. You're right? at three minutes, so please round yes, it yes. off. Almost over. If the symptoms get worse, then externally it can mediate a COVID test. Next. Um, then if it's really bad, then the ambulance can send them to the hospital and um, uh, the family gets an alert. Next. COVID also gives all the data to the bigger healthcare research authorities that are carrying out COVID research. Next. And this system can also be used after COVID to monitor their health. That is how it's a sustainable and viable bigger business model, which can also be used for future pandemics. Let's hope there's none. Um, <laughs> our team is across uh, the fields of industrial design, uh, tech, and service design, Sorry. interaction design. That's it. Thanks. I have to stop you. <laughs> Thank, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Good. Um, any questions from the judges? Hey, this is Ryan. Um, so nicely done. So my question quickly is, um, have you identified any partners for the hardware components? So the smart pillow and the mask? Um, would my, one of my teammates like to answer that question? Uh, actually not really, because what we try to do right now is to identify the product itself and understand the technology which can actually help us capture the better data because right now most of the applications which are there system is based on certain questionnaire and we and that doesn't solve the problem of you know reliability so we felt that you know how do we accurately capture the data and then we see what kind of you know technical collaboration we can do but definitely we have done uh, thought a model where uh, for the distribution which is based on the NGO and the government uh, this thing and some of the people who can afford it they can also buy for personal use usage. Thank you. Just Thank you. on that, do you have a rough sense of the cost of the actual physical components that you'd be mailing to people? Yeah, so I think I think one of the benchmarks we kept was like if you really look at how much the COVID-19 test cost in India it costs around $75, okay? And we really felt that, you know, anything which is less than that, 
could be a good thing to offer okay and if you look at the five or six sensor uh, they cost uh, something around total maybe uh, say around 30 dollars and uh, so the cost will be actually within the 50 dollars of maybe the manufacturing cost will be within the 50 dollars of that so in comparison to the cost of the test uh, that's our benchmark and we felt that you know, people will be happy using it. Even the government of India, who has to spend, uh, or who has to, who is struggling with the kits, the testing kit, they would be happy providing this particular uh, system to the uh, home, so that a lot of people don't turn up for testing to to the healthcare centers. Thank you. I have to stop you here. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Our next team is team cove alert Alrighty, please let me know when i can start uh, yes um yeah you go ready Alrighty. it's our pleasure to present to you uh our system that we've been working on it's called cove alert and it's a sms based rural health triage and monitoring system next slide please so let's start off uh, by looking at the three key aspects of this project. Uh, the first is the accessibility problem that exists in many current healthcare systems and with many of the interventions that um, we're coming up with. Um, the second is how our CoveAlert system overcomes these issues. And finally, we'll talk about how the CoveAlert system can be pragmatically and effectively implemented. So let's start off with accessibility. Next. So in the US, 31% of households lack broadband access. Um, and this means that approximately 100 million Americans are at risk of missing out on key health alerts from governments and other essential information that might be helpful in uh, helping them navigate the crisis. And perhaps more importantly, any population level health triage system that you put in place would likely underserve or fail to serve this large population. Next slide. So this is where our system, uh, Cove Alert, comes in. Um, the system has two main facets. First, an opt-in patient-facing SMS-mediated chatbot, and second, a server-based dashboard, which is available to healthcare administrators. Next slide, please. Our three main pillars of the Cove Alert model are patient education, symptom monitoring, and timely intervention. Next slide, please. Um, so let's look at a sample workflow. Um, as symptoms appear, people will get in touch with the SMS chat box. And as symptoms progress, a clinical volunteer or a clinician will help to monitor their symptoms. In the case of worsening symptoms, people are then referred to local healthcare services. Next slide, please. On the side of the healthcare admin, they are able to monitor each patient's symptoms as well as their last messages to the service. In addition, they can send messages to the patient or call them if necessary. Next slide, please. In terms of our system's architecture, the chatbot can be powered with Microsoft HealthBot or Google Dialogflow. For the backend, we're using cloud platform services such as Cloud Functions and Firestore Database to handle storage of patient profiles. The data is relayed securely to hospitals and healthcare systems as needed. And lastly, the Twilio API is used to send SMS messages to the communities. Next slide. So let's finally talk about how we can work with public and private stakeholders to make this idea a reality. So we propose the following implementation plan. The system is rolled out and administered by state governments in the US to communicate with the public back and forth via SMS. State governments can con contract capacity from private telehealth agencies to provide on-call professionals uh, to check in remotely with patients as needed and data will be stored confidentially and securely on state-owned servers, and hospitals can then access this information only with the, patient, only with the patient's consent. Um, this data can also be used by researchers, but with the information uh, anonymized. And in closing, I think something's happened to the screen. There we go. In closing, CoveAlert enables states to provide if you can go to the very last section. There we go. Uh, in closing, Cove Alert enables states to provide an innovative yet pragmatic approach to community health monitoring and triage. And the solution 
prioritizes accessibility, leverages the cutting edge of artificial intelligence and ensures information security, all of which are paramount to managing the current COVID crisis. Thank you. That's our presentation. Thanks. We'd love to hear your questions. Great. Did you mention, um, just quickly, uh, thank you very much, first of all, um, did you mention the rural America reaching out to some of those communities that might be more difficult to reach and, and what would the plan be to do so? Sorry, could you repeat that question? So you, oops, I'm unmuted, right? Um, so you mentioned that you would reach the rural part of America, right? So, That's right. yes, so what's the plan to reach these areas? Right, so, um, as I mentioned, like the reason we cannot reach them is because rural communities are usually where people lack internet access. And the way we are going to reach them is by SMS, which is the text messaging service. And the reason this works is because 98% of Americans actually have, have phones. Uh, a smaller proportion, I think around 70% have smartphones, but 98% um, of them have any sort of cell phone. So SMS is a very uh, commonly available system for that. And if we're partnering with state governments, they have access to phone number registries of citizens and they can use it to relay public health information and to broadcast that the service exists. This is, this is Michael. Why state government and not FQHCs or critical access hospitals or, or care delivery entities? Right. So we wanted something that would be, we wanted the system to be implemented by a central uh, source. Uh, by handing it over to some sort of private agency, it would inhibit the ability for uh, researchers to gain access to that data, for other health, for local private clinics and hospitals to gain access to the data. Um, so there's, it just makes a lot more sense to centralize it because this is in the interests of every state government because that'll help them reduce their um, costs in the long term. And get thank, back you. Yeah, thank you. Great, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. There was Lyrics. And up next. Up next is let me see. Cove MD. Hello. Are you ready? Yes. Great. Okay, I'm about to start. Oh yeah, before, yeah. can we just make sure that uh, sound is working on your computer? Because there's a couple of videos inside that have sound. The sound on my computer is working. Okay. So that we can play into the microphone, potentially. Yeah. Let me see if I need to do anything for that. Um, okay. I think before it worked when we had the sound. So. Okay. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, so yeah, 3.9 billion people, or half of the world's population, have now been asked or ordered to stay at home to prevent the spread of the deadly COVID-19 virus. While in quarantine, a person may have numerous questions and concerns regarding symptoms and even aftercare post-infection. With the surge of cases worldwide, local healthcare systems may be strained. A simple 911 call might not do the trick, and with the abundance of content and misinformation, getting the right professional help may be more time consuming, costly, and risky than ever before. Next slide. Meanwhile, in countries and regions where the peak has passed, doctors are seeing cases fall. 40,000 doctors who went to Wuhan from across China have now returned home. These doctors are experienced and professionals at treating COVID patients and comprise an untapped resource in the global COVID pandemic. Next slide. We present OVMD, a telemedicine platform that connects doctors and countries that have passed the surge of infection to patients in countries where the healthcare system is struggling to tri triage them at home. We aim to combine clinical need and available expertise across borders. This technology has the potential to connect any combination of countries. And for this pitch, we will focus on the US and China. Next slide. A patient can sign on to CovMD and get on the spot immediate consultation from an experienced foreign doctor and a translator who can help the two of them communicate as well as convey the differences specific to that patient's regional standard of care. When he opens the browser, he will fill in a brief type form to assess the patient's language options and urgency. Next slide. 
Once he makes a small payment, which could potentially be subsidized by partners and other national health organizations, he will be on call with a doctor and a translator in minutes. We've asked and consulted Dr. Zhang Song, who reaffirms the interest of Chinese doctors and supports CovMD's feasibility. He's joining us for this demo on his way back from a successful mission working at the front lines of the pandemic in Wuhan, China. Next slide. So do you have a history of coughing? Um, and have you had um, any CT scan taken in the hospital that you can share? Next slide, please. On the other end, CovMD has the potential to drastically decrease the workload of the ER, ER so that they can prioritize patients that need immediate attention. It will play an essential part in flattening the curve on a global scale. Next slide. We already have our platform up and running and expect the la to launch this project within the coming month as it is rapidly deployable. You can find our link below on this slide and the first. Our team aims to redistribute medical expertise across borders, make consultation widely accessible but also reliable, and most importantly, mitigate risk before a person even steps out the door. A COVID-19 professional a million miles away is now ready to see you in his virtual office. All you have to do is click once. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Um, any questions? This is Michael. Just uh, so I understand on the demand side, why, why it would be attractive. What's, what's the supply side look like? How are you enrolling international cadre physicians into this? Um, so I'm going to pass this over to our teammate, uh, Grace. Okay. Hi. Um, so um, from the supply side, we have a lot, a lot of Chinese doctors who actually have first experience in Wuhan. Um, so as we know right now, there are 40,000 um, doctors returning home from Wuhan um, who have successfully treated a lot of COVID patients. Um, and from our understanding, the side of the U.S. Um, health system is very strained, and most doctors and nurses um, are really trapped in the year handling a lot of COVID patient cases. Um, so to help alleviate that stress, um, we think it's a really, really good option to bring those Chinese forces into this. And just to kind of clarify, it doesn't have to be limited to, you know, a specific U.S. to China model. This can go into different combinations of countries as well. It's really about kind of taking a specific population that is very successful and experienced and redistributing that on a kind of global scale through technology. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. We have to go on. Great. Thanks. Thank you, Babette. Thanks. Um, our next team is the virtual nurse. Hey, yeah. can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. And yeah, you can go. Hi, we are a team virtual nurse and we are here to fill in the major gap that exists in the digital support for COVID-19. Next, please. Since the start of the pandemic, a lot of individuals and organizations have flooded the online stores and digital solutions. Uh, however, these apps are only helping vulnerable populations to check symptoms based on the subjective questions. There is no monitoring tool that helps uh, patients who have been tested positive. Uh, what we need to realize is that only 19% of the COVID positive patients are hospitalized. The rest, 81% of, of them are either isolating at home or in quarantine zones. What to, do now, what to do now and how to monitor the health while you're isolating is where the virtual nurse comes in. Next. WIEN is a telematic uh, tri triaging app. Next. It is mainly meant for anyone who is tested positive and isolating at home or in quarantine zone. Next. It is meant to be used in the absence or presence of any basic health tools. The user selects what tools are available and the app adapts the route ac accordingly. Uh, it can be used to monitor yourself or your loved one. Next. The algorithm validates the qualitative and the quantitative data it gets uh, based on the national and WHO guidelines and determines the potential risk of the risk level of the user. Next. 
app also shows visualizations and supports exporting data as a report to be shared with and to connect uh, and basically the connect feature enables you to share the report with the uh, your healthcare pro provider or with any loved one to help monitor your uh, your progress next the frequency uh, the frequency and of the reminders basically depends on the health of the patient next the major goal for the app is to be independent of any tools. So if a user doesn't have a thermometer, for instance, we can use other assessment tools for gross health monitoring. Next. In case of, for, of uh, fever, for instance, we can use these subjective tools, uh, subjective questions to determine the health. Uh, next. Next. Uh, and we can have them measure vitals manually through a step-by-step -step guide. Next. Next. There is also an emergency link that can send an automated message to 911 that this is a COVID positive patient that needs help so they can come prepared or it can also show them the nearby hospitals that have COVID units. Next. Um, we initially wanted to pilot in New York uh, because uh, the, time, the timeline for the full development of this app is three weeks and given the, the curve for New York and that New York sh uh, shows 30% of the US cases, um, uh, we suspect that we'll be able to assist 15,000 people and have 15, 30, over 30 millions in savings. Next. We plan to build the app as a pro bono. Our major cost is hosting and marketing of the app. So that for that, we will need to we plan on partnering and getting sponsorship for the, these organizations. Next. We are a diverse team with medical practitioners and researchers who have uh, the IT specialist and the team to design uh, effective algorithms and the business experts who came together to basically validate the need. Uh, and given our expertise, we can totally develop this app in-house, but we'll need help with the sponsorship and for hosting and uh, marketing of the app. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any questions from our judges? Uh, hi, this is Ryan. So how do you get this in the hands of the users? So basically, uh, it will be through, uh, since we are, we are planning to uh, partner with and sponsor with uh, the foundations, we plan to market it through them and through their platforms to uh, ensure the credibility and to help people know that this is an, this is an app that exists out there. And it can also be shared on the, uh, like advertised on the CDC platform uh, for people to use since not many apps exist out there to help monitor once you have been tested positive. So that's the marketing route that we want to take. Great. And, and adding to that as well, uh, that there are various avenues uh, because uh, we can partner, we are also looking to partner with insurance organizations because on the other side, we are saving a lot of, uh, uh, we are saving a lot of pain for the, these patients going out over there. And uh, so the, the, all these insurance income is being saved. Uh, for these insurance organizations. So we being a B2C company, we might not be able to reach out to larger customers, but uh, partnering with these organizations, we'll be having a larger customer base. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Right. Well, then up next, so this was team virtual nurse. And up next is team Good Timing, which changed its name to Voice Text Triage. Okay, so there are a few more. I'm gonna check where, how I'm gonna find the new slides. So. Ed, I have a copy of the slides ready to go if that helps you at all. Okay. Yeah. You want me to share? Yeah. Okay, I'm sharing the screen. And then um, there was a note to make sure we had share computer sound. Okay, can you hear me and see everything? Yeah, great. Cute little robot. Okay, so um, who is in need? There is a large population who are not sure what to do now. They're concerned, misinformed, lonely, and technologically adverse. Some are illiterate, remote, and frail. So how do we provide them with an answer to a simple concern? How do I have COVID-19? Should I leave the house? How do I get there? Etc. cetera. Uh, next slide, please. Sorry. 
Um, so triage is the initial step to assess the potential risks and plan for the next move. Mitigate exposure and spread the infection. Appropriately balance available resources, lower unnecessary ER and hospital resources, such as beds and misdirected attention. The ER already incurs a frequent flyer and avoidable admission problem. And at this time with the pandemic, it's where you're unable to project what the cost would be accurate with seasonality data. So let's look at our voice and text-based triage platform. Um, yes, COVID screening is actively in place, but does it accommodate? We're proposing a two available channel system to make uh, screens accessible and lightweight for those that lack modern devices. Utilizing Google Cloud services for speech recognition and Twilio for our text-driven dialogue, we can capture the CDC recommended flow for self-assessment. Combine that with social determinants of health and to score the potential risk of the individual and provide a clear comforting decision to the person. Should I stay safe at home? Can I be assured I'm okay? Should I seek help? How does that happen? And what means are available to even get me there? So a quick little demo here. This would be the user experience. Are you answering for yourself or someone else? I'm calling for myself. What is your age? I am 44. Are you gasping for air? No, I'm not gasping. Moderate to severe difficulty breathing? Yes, I can't breathe. Urgent medical attention may be needed. Please go to the emergency department. And then as a fallback, what about an SMS-based approach? Even with a relatively small population of smartphone users, especially in remote era, areas, they don't have patients on their smartphone. Legacy means such as voice and text capability is still there. So the business plan, um, with carriers available worldwide, with various entities to partner with, and the maturity of cloud-based infrastructure platforms and solution-based architecture, let's identify the current population and push the solution to Google, Azure, Amazon, wherever open source is provided, and spread the word to anyone that is within reach, can be heard, can be comforted, and given a recommended plan without fear if they're making the right life-saving decision. One thing I do want to remind you that the data, time sensitive, accumulates quickly and can be harvested for meaningful use. The act of calling, texting, or any interaction registers them for interactions, especially those entities that have been tasked with a monitoring spread of COVID-19. Thank you very much and thank you to my fellow team members. Thank you. Any questions from the judges? Yeah, so um, have you spoken to any of these partners? What would the rollout plan be for the product? Is anyone else on my team want to answer that? Yeah, so I will answer that question. Like, yeah, so I work with I work in Massachusetts, Boston. So I I I was spoke to somebody at uh, Department of Public Health in Massachusetts, and because like uh, we are going to we are going to send this as a push. We are going to uh, want we want virtual triage as a push for everybody in the state. So initially, what we want to partner with Department, local Massachusetts Department of Public Health as a, to find out identify the population of the state of Massachusetts. Thank you. Thank we can you. have one more question. Okay. Mike. Oh, may I just uh, add in? So, so it just, I was muted just now. So uh, I've contacted the Chinese CDC and because they have a set of data which is combined the location, the people's uh, social determinants of health, as well as their health status. So we can also borrow that use of data to churn out our project within, within one week. Okay. Great. What was the name again of the team? The name into the chat. Oh yes. Yeah. This team is voice text triage and their name previously was good timing. Can we put a uh, voice text triage into our form? Yeah. yeah. Great. 
Thank you. If you can stop sharing your screen, I will start sharing again. Fast Track AI. So we're back on the. We are up. Let me see if I can. I think you can uh, see the whole. Okay, one second. Hi, um, would it be possible for us to share the screen since we have to like run a demo? Um, okay, if you can do it now, I preferably that I do it, but. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Okay, good yes. to go. Good to go. Hi, I'm Dr. Kim, and I'm part of the Fast Track AI, previously known as Corona Home. Let me tell you a simple story. Dr. Smith is a telemedicine cardiologist in New York. She has 50 visits to complete today. She has no way to know which patient should be seen first. And we have Jane, a 35-year-old teacher in New York with a congenital heart defect. She started to experience mild shortness of breath and runny nose. After leaving multiple voice, uh, voicemails, the clinic manager gets back to her saying she can be seen virtually in two days. She is frustrated and is thinking about going to the ED. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, there was a 50% increase in telehealth visits across many healthcare systems in the US. In clinic, Cleveland Clinic alone, there was an 18 times increase in virtual visits in March. Telehealth professionals be a way to triage at home patients with pre existing conditions, calling into the clinic so they can, so the professionals can see their urgent patients first. As you can see in the, in our demo, fast track is a smartphone application where patients input their symptoms, medical history and relevant patient data to facilitate a telehealth visit. Next. So based on the patient's data input, our proprietary machine learning algorithm will produce an acuity index based on different weights on severity of symptoms. Then it will generate a color code to be visualized in the provider's interface. Next. Then the telehealth provider can see the quick summary of showing patient's demographic, medical history, and symptoms, and the patient's risk of contracting COVID-19. I hand it over to Cynthia. Hi, my name is Cynthia Gard, and the version of our technical solution continues with integrations and telehealth partners. This will create a huge value for everyone, medical professionals and patients alike. Firstly, FastTrack AI is an intelligent at-home triaging system, which will reduce calls to telehealth workers, alleviate hospital traffic and stress systems, and more importantly, it will reduce the possibility to infect others or get infected. The app is free and no insurance is required. Next. We think Fast Track AI is highly viable because the critical need it meets and solves. It is highly feasible because the technology involved to execute it. And although tech, te telehealth integrations are part of the complete vision, we expect an accelerated build time for its first release to be three to four weeks. Next. We're already talking to tele health platform companies to integrate our solution, and we will continue to do more of it. Next. From experienced machine scientists, designers, and strategists, our team is diverse. You're at three minutes, so please and round it off. In innovative, mission-driven to solve a more important problem right now. We want humanity to not only survive for today, but for future generations to come. We welcome you to view our prototype, which is in the chat box. Thank you. This is Michael. Um, why why not just integrate go right to the EHR and get into history of present illness and all that directly? Well, because a lot of the uh, so a lot of the telehealth visits at major hospitals are so uh, inundated, uh, so and uh, overcrowded. 
so that people are, a lot of patients are going towards uh, a whole new platform with uh, you know others, uh, you know different set of uh, telehealth providers. So a lot of the telehealth providers, they they have no they these are brand new patients. I haven't seen them before the the telehealth visit. So a lot of them are kind of fresh, you know, kind of new patients, uh, just because you know because of the overcrowding of the the, the major hospitals. Thank you. Any one more question? Any other questions? Okay, great, thank you. Let's go to the next team. Um, so this was Fast Track AI and up next is Team Confident. Scott, are you? Here. Yeah, we're here, we're ready. Do you want to use yeah. your screen or mine? Please share your screen. Okay. Let me yes. Yeah, please go. So we are confident uh, AI and we are at home in triage and monitoring. And bear with me while we're having a, here we go. So the key question is how do we manage the patient search? So predicted in New York state in 45 days, we're gonna have a 57,000 bed deficit and a 9,400 9, deficit of ventilators. So the real issue there is which COVID patients should be admitted to the hospital? And to break down that problem even further, you've got a fear factor within the patients themselves and conflicting guidance, but you also have higher volumes of non-emergent cases at the clinical side, and they're trying to decide who should be let in. One of the key insights we found from talking to physicians in the ED department is there's a lack of objective clinical data that they need to actually understand what factors are driving the health of each individual patient. And they also need to do that over time. So they've got 21 days that the COVID uh, virus tends to work through a person and it needs to integrate into their EHR system. So we factored that into our equations. So our goal is to not only increase availability of the beds for the sickest people, but to monitor those symptoms over a long time, capture that biometric data, and then help the clinicians and patients make more informed decisions is who should be admitted so they can get the right care at the right place at the right time. So our triage and monitoring technology assesses each individual patient's symptoms, captures the biometric data, and conveys that to the clinical staff inside of their current uh, workflows. And capturing the data, instead of use the, sending out new hardware, use the existing hardware that's already in the patient's home. So if they've got a Fitbit, if they've got an iPhone or an Android, if they've got a BP cuff or a thermometer, to measure those key aspects of actual health and integrate that using into the EHR using a Smart on Fire app and be able to have multiple access points. So that if the patient has a mobile phone, great. If they have web-based, great. Uh, we can work through multiple channels. So we want to be able to integrate not only with the EHR, but with the workflow that the clinical staff is already using to triage patients. Our business model is using a B2B SaaS model. So the health system is actually our customer. It's free to use and intuitive for both the patient, the nurse, and the telemedicine clinicians. Uh, and it's based on an installation fee plus a SaaS fee based on patient quantity. So we've got a great team of clinical experts, data scientists, designers, engineers, and business people. And we've been backed by uh, clinical experts at Denver Health and Augusta University Medical Center. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, Georges, any questions from your side? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, how quickly would you be able to, uh, to roll something like this out? Uh, we're actually talking about doing so within the next 48 hours of having an MVP that we could roll out to Denver Health. 
And so let me just reframe a little bit also. What's the MVP based since you're going to implement multiple um, external um, capturing tools for the biomedical data? So is the MVP one way is, you can Yeah, I was going to the first case, the MVP is going to replicate their current uh, triage workflow and then add in where we can start integrating the data from the uh, outside sources. So whether that's a, a BP cuff, thermometers, uh, those are actually the key leading indicators as fever starts is the first onset. Uh, so we want to start capturing that in information now and then start adding in different uh, uh, data sources as we move through. Thank you. We have time for one more question. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Team Confidant. Great. Then we have our final, um, our final team, and that is Save the Poor. Hello. Yes. Hello. Great. Great. Okay. Yes, ready. Yeah, we are. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, can you? Yeah, great. Um, we are well, thinking about um, a solution to protect people who have no access to um, the internet, to public information, who not even know that there's a virus who can be deadly, which can be deadly for them. So um, with no smartphones, cell phones, um, internet, whatever, no TV, no access to the information. So it, it's a question in India, South Africa, uh, America, South America, Africa. So we thought about a solution for them to spread the information. And uh, what is the cheapest, simplest way to reach them? They can't read. And we've thought about a comic PDF file to share, open source, which can be printed everywhere and is able to um, uh, understand for a little child grown up with no school education or old old people we want to protect them from getting the virus and therefore maybe the next we tried yeah that's a comic it's a, a placeholder but like there's a, a virus it's in the air when when you get this kind of symptoms you can spread it and this is the first step we made but we want to get in contact with some friends of mine uh, designers who who are able to make a product out of it it's a simple sheet a four sheet which can be printed so after that prototype or sheet we want to contact governments institutions sponsors who are able to print that and then we want to contact um, um, like social workers organizations to get in contact with uh, these people to, uh, and are able to uh, give the information through this sheet to the people it would be an opportunity on the next <laughs> um, thing with drones to throw uh, sheets out into the slum or township or whatever could be but it could be much more simpler like people who are giving the information to the people so yeah that's about it okay exactly three minutes thank you um <laughs> judges any questions Hi, this is Ryan. Uh, thank you for uh, for that. That was great. Um, so my question is, is this a basically public awareness campaign? And if so, how would you pay for it? 
Uh, yes, it is mainly a public awareness campaign and we are trying to get uh, sponsors like Red Cross or all the um, institutions who are um, taking care of this kind of people all the time. So that's, that will be the next step when we have a proper prototype to show. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Okay, no. <laughs> thank you. Um, thanks. Yeah, our team. Yeah, great. I did forget our team. Great team. <laughs> <laughs> Two uh, English people and like me. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, this is Team Save the Poor. Um, so, um, I think we're done. Is there any anyone who hasn't presented who was supposed to present please let me know okay great thank you so up next the judges will go into um deliberation and then um later on in the general um at four in the big channel room, there will be the announcements of the winners of uh, the room. But I want to say thank you everyone so much. It was absolutely great. It's been an honor to spending so much time with you over this weekend, virtually, virtual time. Um, honestly, I'm, uh, I'm amazed. Um, I think you're such a great group of people and it's so amazing to see everyone in such a short time, what you've presented here. It's uh, I don't have any words for it. It's it's truly amazing. Um, I think there were there were uh, like great ideas and solutions, and uh, every one of you, each team, whether you win or not, um, we want to provide everyone uh, with the resources to to continue. So um, please, everyone, be motivated. Um, whatever uh, the outcome is, to to continue working uh, on your ID, and um, yeah. Um, great work and judges thank you so much um, I think you also did an amazing job um, it was an honor to have you here great input and uh, I know it's going to be hard to um, find the winners based on this but thank you thank you Pavan. thank, thank you. you thank you to everybody amazing thanks thank you. yeah, thanks to all the teams for presenting thank you, thank you. I would like to ask the judges to go to our Slack room and we'll set up a Slack call from there.